Anybody uh, who uh, tackles the topic of uh, consciousness does it at uh, risk. There's a famous uh, quote you're all I'm sure familiar with by the British psychologist uh, Stuart Sutherland who observed that uh, consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written about it. That's where you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> but uh, uh, Sutherland is uh, dead. So uh, I slipped this book in afterwards, and uh, that's what I want to uh, tell you about today. And what we're going to do is start with the realization as framed by two American philosophers, uh, John Searle, on the one hand, who believes that consciousness is a something, it's intrinsic content of the subjective state can be studied in uh, scientific terms, whereas uh, Dan Dennett says, yes, it can be studied, but it's like an illusion. It's like magic. The brain works, and we have this sensation of what we're calling consciousness. And illusions are extremely powerful phenomena, as everybody knows. In this famous one by Roger Shepard, these two tables look quite different. But as you can see from this short video, in fact, the surfaces are exactly the same, and yet we would maintain uh, with great certainty uh, that they, they were not. So uh, what I want to do in approaching this very difficult problem is break it into uh, three sort of parts. I want to take a look at the three early theoretical models of the mind. I want to then show you some structural models of the brain and then talk about what I think is the major problem of cognitive neuroscience, which is to try to figure out the gap, the mind-brain gap. What is an explanation going to look like that will instruct us, inform us, how neurons become mind, how neurons, we go from ob objective to subjective. Now, as a species, uh, we've hadn't had many ideas on this topic. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians believed that nature and uh, was just, uh, uh, we were at one with nature. Uh, it took the Greeks to say, no, no, there's an objective uh, uh, thing to be understood, and it probably comes from the, the body. And as time moved on, uh, people bought the notion that somehow the brain was involved with producing uh, the mind, but also that there was a spirit that exited the brain upon death. And finally, we got to uh, Descartes, who said, no, there's actually two states. There's a mental and a physical, and they make contact at a particular part of the brain. And as you go through history and all the great philosophers, people basically, all the way up until, until the present, and including the present, sorted themselves out amongst the three theories, that the brain makes the mind, that's the end of the story, that the brain makes the mind, but there's a spirit that leaves at the end of life, uh, or that they're just two entities from the beginning. So if you take it quickly, in the, Egyptian, the, Egyptians, the Egyptians thought the Nile was alive, she was mad, she flooded the valleys, she uh, was uh, mad, she, there would be a drought and so forth. and so. What the Greeks did, they, they took the world from a thou as, as it would be put to an it. They're, the Greeks came along and said, no, there is a universe, it is a tangible whole, there's a single order, there's a science that we can uh, derive, establish, to be able to describe uh, the nature uh, of the world. Uh, the first view was uh, held out by the Frankfurts uh, and, uh, and very uh, wonderfully articulated in their book, uh, the intellectual achievement of ancient man. And of course, we have the Greeks to really get us going into modern scientific method. And uh, over the, after the, the uh, uh, Egyptians uh, came, the, of course, the Greeks and the Romans and the people say, let's get physical, as I like to put it. What, what is this thing? How does the brain do, us, do this? 
and Herophilus and Aristotus, 320 BC, discovered the nervous system. They're generally credited with, with seeing that there is this thing called the nervous system. They found the ventricles, and they thought spirits flowed down through the hollow nerves from the ventricles. That's, that's not bad, you know, for uh, a long time ago, almost 2,500 years ago. And then Galen came across with uh, uh, measuring uh, and assessing the cadavers from uh, gladiators, and he, could, he was also allowed to uh, dissect uh, uh, Barbary apes. And he put the brain uh, as the organ for rational thought. He put the heart uh, as the site for spiritual matters and appetitive uh, processes in the liver. Didn't quite get it right until uh, Vesalius came along in 1500, the greatest anatomist maybe ever, and uh, he saw that things weren't as were described in earlier uh, descriptions, but as I said in my book, in an attempt to save his skin, <laughs> he didn't make a big point about this uh, with the church. So, so then, while all that was going on uh, in the Mediterranean, there was the Paris salons. And there was one particular salon that was, must have been quite a, a scene. It, um, Marine Mersenne, Pierre Gassendi, Rene Descartes, and Thomas Hobbes all used to meet on a regular basis to discuss uh, the mental and the physical. And uh, it was uh, Marsan who was a, a, a fellow priest. Uh, he defended Galileo. He's a mathematician, a theologian. He was a mu music theorist, Joe, so how about that? And uh, Church had to accept the view. He felt that the universe was a mechanistic. God could rule a mechanistic universe, so get over the fact that it's, it's uh, mechanistic. And uh, Gassendi, another philosopher, mathematician, priest, uh, said everything's made of atoms, and, uh, but atoms could not reflect on themselves, so he introduced the idea, therefore, humans must have some sort of immaterial, rational soul. Uh, and they all believe that at, upon death, uh, the soul left uh, the body. Uh, and then, of course, Descartes was the senior person at the seminar, the organizer. I am he came up with his famous, I am thinking and have no doubt about it. That makes it indubitable, and I am not wrong. That makes it infallible, I think, uh, therefore I am. And it was also Descartes who gets credit for thinking that the brain works like a machine. He was living at the time of uh, Vacusson, who had the mechanized uh, duck, the digestive system of the duck, and he thought the brain was very mechanistic, but he simply held the view that the mind, the immaterial mind, made contact at the brain in a particular spot uh, uh, in the pineal gland. But he, again, if you trace back, where did this notion that the brain is a machine come from? It really uh, came from Descartes. And it's interesting that the word conscious was used uh, for the first time by Descartes, kind of almost in a footnote of his uh, treatise. Um, so, the big boy in the room, though, if you look back at it in history, was, was Hobbes, and I will call this the British resistance. Thomas Hobbes said no to this dualism, no to souls after death. Uh, Hobbes thought like an engineer about the mind of the brain. He was very clear about the distinctions that had to be made if we were going to move forward uh, scientifically. And of course, the, the idol of most Western philosophers, David Hume, said no to dualism, no to axiom, and yes to Newton. Uh, Hume really wanted to be and was responsible for establishing the science of man. And by the way, for the students in the room, he did this at the age of 23. So uh, you can work a little longer each day, and uh, maybe you can catch up. Well, things pretty much stayed in that category uh, for a number of years, and I'm going to pick up the modern uh, trends uh, based uh, from the uh, Pontifical Academy a meeting uh, in Rome in, in 1962. Uh, this was a meeting uh, chaired and organized by Sir John Eccles, and my mentor, uh, Roger Sperry, was there, Joe's great-grandfather, and, uh, and Don Mackay, the British physicist uh, and historian. And what's interesting is, in, at that time, and really till today, these, th these same three views uh, are present in thinking. Eccles was a dualist. 
uh, he believed that the mind entered the supplementary motor area instead of the pineal gland, but a dualist he was uh, in his thinking. And Sperry uh, believed in the sort of emergent properties, the way he put it, when it comes to brains, remember always the simpler forces and laws, though still present and operating, have all been superseded in the brain dynamics by the, con the configurational forces of higher level mechanisms. And finally, Mackay's view, uh, even though he was the physicist engineer and, and actually had the best model of the three, uh, believed uh, in an afterlife, and as you can see uh, right there, it's going up right after that accident. Uh, so, so more recent models uh, tend to d d discuss networks, and there are various kinds of networks, and people use fMRI and, and tractography and lesion work and all kinds of things to try to figure out which critical networks are somehow underlying our subjective experience, our sense of uh, conscious reality. And uh, uh, these uh, six distinguished scientists have all worked on it, and they all have various versions of network theories of how they somehow come together to, perform, to, to enable the subjective sense that uh, we, all, we all experience. I'm going to break away from that because I have a, a different hunch as to how things are organized, and I'll call it a hunch uh, in, with respect to uh, the, the difficulty of the problem and it's the sense that comes from uh, being around this problem for uh, 50 years. So I'm going to uh, take the view that the large centralized circuits are all going to be worked out, and there are many uh, arguments there, but in fact, the way I see the field as over the, my time in it is that there's more and more evidence for discrete modularity, and that maybe there's local and specific and multiple thousands, if not millions, of uh, lo local circuits that become enabled and allow for that conscious experience. And that what we have is we should think in terms of a, what I'm gonna call the bubbling brain, that these circuits all come up through time, in time, and whatever is up at a particular moment in time is what we are experiencing as a conscious uh, reality. So that's the, that's the metaphor. Let's see what I can do to support it. Uh, so first of all, we know consciousness can be divided. These are some of the split brain patients studied over the year. The top row are the Caltech original series that I studied with Sperry. And the bottom of the row there are patients that uh, Joe and I studied for years uh, on, the, on the East Coast. And the basic finding, as you know in, in, from the split brain work, is that consciousness can be divided, that what can be uh, introduced to one half brain simply is unknown to the opposite brain. What is introduced to that brain is, is unbeknownst to its opposite brain. And you get the split brain phenomenon. Uh, so the idea that I'm extending here is that we can certainly divide it in two. I think we can keep dividing, 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 and so forth. So therefore, the, the bubble metaphor. But there's another neurologic fact that you can keep in mind and that is, you can't seem to stamp consciousness out. Anybody who walks the wards knows that uh, wherever, whatever patient you see, you'll see uh, deficits of a particular kind, but you certainly would not uh, or, uh, describe the patient as not conscious. Here's an example of a patient, let's see if this works, who, is, uh, who has Wernicke's aphasia and has a, a severe cognitive impairment, and yet you would hardly not call him uh, conscious. Here we go. Yeah, right. <laughs> I imagine it's those that kinds of well, we have to get the white and go. black and uh, so forth. So Which anyway, not he's not making a whole lot well, of sense. Give it a try. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet, uh, so you would how certainly. Are you feeling today? Uh, call, call, Is there any chance that uh, there's a volume? Mm -hmm. today? Yeah. I uh, terribly, okay. very uncomfortable. Uh, so. So what, what this, what this is, is to illustrate the form is that there, with all the specific uh, vast number of neurologic uh, syndromes that we've all studied uh, and, and the specificity of the losses that, that is sometimes striking, uh, the notion that the patient has somehow lost consciousness is, is just not there. They are, they are conscious in some uh, general sense. And so this then, uh, the idea that there are all these systems that come up through time and through time 
we weave our story of a unified conscious experience comes up with this uh, bubbling uh, metaphor. Uh, here, uh, I won't show this video because it apparently doesn't work. Uh, uh, here's a split brain patient, case VP, and what we're doing is uh, showing her the word uh, breakfast and, and the way it's presented, uh, the, the break, the first part of the word is in one visual field, which means it goes to its right hemisphere. And the last half of the word fast is presented in the opposite visual field, which means it goes to its left hemisphere. And this particular patient spoke out of both hemispheres. So how would it uh, say, how would it see this word? And what it does is it, the patient says it in series, and to us on the outside, it looks like there's total unity of conscious experience, but in fact, it's two completely different systems speaking through time, and it makes it appear like there's a unified, uh, unified mechanism going on, when in fact, because we know the total situation, that's not what's going on at, at all. So, uh, so two independent hemispheres stitched together in time, through time, boom, 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 just like, and it happens extremely quick in microsecond, millisecond level. Uh, what appears to be a unified experience is in fact the independent modules asserting themselves. So this leads us in, okay, well, if you have that model, there's still this thorny problem, the, the thorny problem of how do neurons become mind, how do cells become mental? And it's been called the explanatory gap uh, by uh, people. Uh, and John Tyndall, the British physicist for years, uh, years ago, uh, put it this way, the passage from physics to the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. There, <clears throat> how are these physical processes connected with the facts of consciousness, he asks. The chasm between the two classes of phenomena would still remain intellectually impassable. So we don't even know, and let's be frank about it, we don't even know what an explanation would even look like. We just don't have the vocabulary yet, and yet I think uh, I want to argue for the fact that we should move in that direction, and I'll make a suggestion. And the uh, more recent philosopher, uh, Joseph Levine, put the same problem, the explanatory gap, the way he put it, we have no idea how a physical object could constitute a subject of experience. There seems to be no discernible connection between the physical description uh, and the mental one. And so this problem has been with mankind, humankind, forever. And uh, when there's a problem hanging around like that forever, seeming impenetrable, uh, it's good to uh, uh, think of uh, Howard Patti, uh, as summary of it, Howard Patti is a uh, a, a physicist turned theoretical biologist, uh, now retired, but over the 50 years that he worked at the State University of New York at Binghamton, he put out 50 beautiful, extremely uh, exquisite papers trying to think about what he called uh, this cut between uh, life and inanimate. But here, here he, he summarizes this problem. When a problem persists, the one, the mind-brain gap, when a problem persists, unresolved for centuries in spite of enormous increases in our knowledge, it is a good bet that the problem entails the nature of knowledge itself. The nature of life is one of these problems. Life depends on matter, but life is not an inherent property, uh, property of matter. That's the puzzle. What, what is it then? And of course, it was in 1943 that Schrodinger wrote his famous little book, What is Life, where he uh, foretold the notion of how cells must somehow contain information to be retold, to be re reproduced. Schrodinger got his ideas about to scripts, about aperiodic crystals, even predicted a new physics. He got it from a paper he read uh, by uh, Max Delbruck on mathematical physics, uh, and Max Delbruck uh, himself was a student of, uh, of Niels Bohr, who was the father of the notion of complementarity. But, but Schrodinger saw it from Max Delbruck's notion, and of course what happened 
uh, after that of 1943 paper where he, he, he floated this notion of aperiodic crystals, that somehow memory was in the, the uh, inanimate, from, became animate structures, uh, that that was a clue and a cue that helped uh, Watson and Crick make their stunning finding in 1954, I think it was. So we will call all of that the, and there's a fascinating detailed history here, which uh, uh, is, is, is just intriguing to read, but we won't go into it now. But it all gave rise to the, what we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna call the molecular biological revolution. We all know it, we all live it. And in fact, I would say the majority of scientists today uh, buy into the notion of a total reductionism explanation of complex life science processes and phenomena in terms of the laws of physics uh, and chemistry. And I'm gonna, as I say, I'm gonna call that the majority view. There's another view, however, and it's called uh, finalism. And what it, that finalism means is there's a lot of things going on and they come together in a final moment to produce uh, life. Uh, and it's uh, represented here by Michael Polanyi, Polanyi the great Hungarian a polymath who, who wound up at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Polanyi wrote, a machine as a whole works under the control of two distinct principles. The higher one is the principle of the machine's design, and this harnesses the lower one, which consists in the physical chemical processes of which the machine relies. So there's the, there's the frog, and then there's the stuff that's inside the frog, and the frog sets boundary conditions on the stuff inside. And when you analyze the life, you have to take both issues into account. I'm gonna call that the minority view, uh, and it remains the minority view. But if you look back through the history of this, uh, a lot of these people who have sort of this more uh, complex view of what it is to describe life, all pass through the University of Chicago and I'm going to, for purpose, I mean, there may be something to this and there may not be something to it. But they were all there. Uh, Rashevsky, the great math biologist. Uh, Polanyi, as I just mentioned. Robert Rosen, the great theoretical biologist. And Roger Sperry. Uh, all were there exchanging notes. And they all believed on something, and I'll just try to capture it, was there's something else than just the straight physical chemical capturing. Uh, uh, that is to be understood if we want to understand the mechanism uh, of mental uh, life. Robert Rosen put it, organization must be independent from the material particles which seemingly constitute a living system. He believed it's the overall architecture, I said, with the boundary conditions and so forth. Uh, and, and he also believed it was a, a layered architecture, which I'll mention in a minute. And uh, so this is the problem set up and this is where, going back to the person I mentioned, Howard Paddy comes in and starts his life work around uh, 1955 uh, and so forth. And Howard was interested in that gap, that gap between mind and brain, between neuron and mind. How do you close that gap? How do you even think about it? And he was uh, inspired, as he put it, how is it possible for us to distinguish the living from the lifeless? if we can describe both conceptually by the motion of inorganic uh, corpuscles. So there's no difference between the stuff that's in life and the stuff that's in not life. So what's the difference? What makes something alive? What makes something not alive? That's the fundamental question that he wanted to move from in understanding these gaps, uh, which he would, will argue are, is similar to the mind-brain gap you can take that gap all the way back to the beginning of life itself. What is it about life? What makes something animate? That was, that was the question that was driving his life uh, and for the next 50 years. And the way Delbrook, weaving this story, the way Delbrook uh, dealt with it was he didn't. He said, oh no, life just comes. It, it's, a, it's a given. You don't understand things that generated life. You don't go back, take it back that far. Life is a given, and you were to understand it in, in terms of comp complementarity. And, uh, and Petit challenges that and takes it right back. And he tells us three things that you have to keep in mind when you want to look at how life starts, how you go from animate, uh, inanimate to animate. 
you need replicability, and through that you get evolvability, and then when you have that evolved structure, you need complementary, complementarity to explain it. So there's a lot of stuff that goes in to those three bullet points, but that's the basic idea that you, get it, you have to get your head around when you understand how we're gonna close uh, this gap. And the implications of replicability are, are clear. It is evolvable. Uh, to evolve, the process has to introduce variation so natural selection can begin to do its work. And variation had to come from a code, an abstract reliable representation of the instructions. Okay, that all makes sense. The substrate of the code is a physical structure, but codes themselves are symbols, and symbols are subjective, follow no physical laws but rules. The gap between non-life and life is bridged by an abstract and physical code, a substance. There is no spook in the system. So that's, that's Howard Patti's idea. Life is seen to be the layered structure. Each layer, each layer has its own vocabulary, something that neuroscience is coming to grips with, but it's a difficult uh, argument. How do layers communicate across the gap in philosophy, biology, it's all the same problem. Uh, and on one side of the gap, for us, the neuroscientists, there's the firing of neurons. On the other, there are symbols, the representation of the physical that have a physical reality. So think of DNA, there's the code, and then there's the proteins being made from that code. So on one hand, it's all physical, it's all driven by physical processes, but there's this introduction of the code, and in that rules, and in rules, very so forth, so on, so on. So uh, all this winds up with a field, I think, where the cognitive neuroscientists of tomorrow is going to have to consider these, these code questions, consider the idea of code biology, and this whole notion of biosemiotics, which put, put there uh, clearly distinguishes life from inanimate matter by its dependence on material, construct, material construction controlled by coded symbolic information. So let me close with just people who, who see uh, that this, some, some realization of this bubbling brain idea, uh, if you, you know, William James famously said that the human is full of instincts. It has, it has thousands of instincts, uh, far more than uh, uh, animals. And as he put it, every impulse, every step of every instinct shines with its own sufficient light and seems at the moment the only eternal right and proper thing to do. It is done for its own sake exclusively. These bubbles, these instincts, however, these modules, whatever we're going to call them, they have an independence, and when they come up, that is the moment. I would say that his notion there is consistent with the bubble idea. Uh, David Hume, the mind is kind of a theater where several perceptions successively make their appearance, pass, repass, glide away, and mingle in an infinite variety of postures uh, and situations. And finally, Sir Charles Sherrington put it, how far is the mind a collection of quasi-independent perceptual minds integrated psychically in large measure by temporal concurrence of experience? Blah, 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 blah. One right after the other, we interpret it as a common uh, integrated uh, experience. Well, finally, uh, I had my turn at the Vatican uh, uh, a few years ago, and uh, it was another conference on brain and consciousness and, and free will. And uh, it was a real uh, pleasure and experience and honor to be there. And we all had uh, our moment by, with uh, shaking the hands of the Pope. And the Pope says something to you when you shake your hand. And this is after two days of all this scientific, secular talk. The Pope says to me, to, I'm sure everybody, but says to me, keep up the good work. And I thought, well, there's a man with an open mind. So I thanked him, and then uh, it was true that a couple months later he resigned. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>